everybody. Victor Simonian, friends, um, and of course all the students. I am so pleased that all of you are here uh, with us today for a conversation, and I hope it is going to be a conversation, on the role of civil society in Armenia. You may be wondering why I, as a representative of, the gov of a government, of the United States government, come here today to talk about the importance of civil society. Because after all, that is uh, civil society, I mean, that's the importance of people working to influence their world outside of the government. The importance of people working to limit or to counterbalance the powers of government. And I'm here to assure you that I'm not doing this to work myself out of a job. I still love my job. Uh, but rather, I'm doing this because I've just seen so many examples all over the world uh, in distant history uh, or in remote places, some before my eyes, that civil society and government are essential to one another and to the success of a democracy. I think you'd all agree that the first priority of any state is to provide for the security of its citizens. A democratic state must have an effective government to create and enforce laws, to settle disputes, and to keep the peace, both internally and with its neighbors. But what we have seen across time and across continents is that when citizens do not believe that the government is representing their interests, there cannot be genuine security. True security is not just the absence of violence. It is the presence of opportunity. It's the opportunity to have a good job, to be able to find a nice place to live and to take care of your family. But it's also the opportunity to make your own decisions, whether that is where you live, whether it is what kind of a job you have, or whether it is participation in the political process and having your voice heard in that process. Just an econ as an economy does not flourish if government officials hold a monopoly on ideas, on resources, on decision making, not allowing businesses to you know, put forth their best ideas and really innovate, a country will stagnate if government wields all the power. Government needs civil society as a skeptic, as a partner, as a challenger, a training ground, and a source of innovation. Government and civil society must work in tandem, like oars on a boat. If only one oar is rowing, the boat loses direction and goes nowhere. Modern history abounds in extreme examples of imbalance between government and civil society. From the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, where governments tried to dominate all of their society's activities, to the failed states of the 21st century, where the absence of an effective government left competing groups to impose their aims through violence. Today, however, the far more common problem is excessive government restriction on and official or unofficial retaliation against the legitimate activities of civil society. And before we go any further, I'm going to answer the question, and some of you may, may, may have a different definition, but I'm going to answer the question of what do we mean when we talk about civil society. We often say civil society as though it's interchangeable with non-governmental organizations. And capable and sustainable NGOs play an essential part in civil society. But civil society really describes an environment a political environment that guarantees all citizens the right to debate issues without fear of retribution, and an information environment in which citizens can hear voices that share or challenge their own points of view. The participants in civil society defy any single description. Large groups, small groups, individuals, NGOs, media organizations, religious congregations, or businesses, opposition, pro-government, neutral. Their concerns may span the nation or the globe, or they may focus on issues as humble, but very important, 
as paving a village's streets. But all these actors need and deserve the freedom to pursue their goals peacefully under the protection of the law. This is a matter of principle. It's also the smart thing to do. As an American, I have a fundamental belief that countries will emerge stronger and more prosperous if their societies are open and their governments are responsive. And if you don't believe me, just look around the world. Which countries are humming with activity, whether it's uh, the, uh, in the economy, whether it's in the government space, whether, whether it's uh, culturally? Which countries you know, really attract you? And which countries are falling into decay? And I'd argue that at least one of the differences lies in how active civil society is in those countries. When it has freedom, civil society can move mountains. Sometimes governments like those mountains right where they are, but when civil society summons enough support to push government toward fundamental change, it is almost always a sign that the time has come for the mountain to move. And one of the best examples of such a movement comes from my own country, from the United States. Within my lifetime, senseless prejudice relegated millions of Americans to second-class citizenship based on the color of their skin. This discrimination did not just reflect the failings of you know, a couple of individuals. It was enforced by laws, laws that betrayed America's ideals and flouted its constitution. But even in the face of such blatant injustice, our government failed to act because such change challenges entrenched economic and political interests. Change is difficult, it is risky, it makes enemies. It took a long, massive, courageous effort on the part of civil society, the civil rights movement, to force America's government to do what it should have done long before. And while we haven't fully completed that journey, we have come a long way to ensuring that today all Americans are blessed to enjoy the freedom and justice won at such cost by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the thousands who supported his vision. And that is just one example from the United States. In, um, women in the United States only got the vote in 1920 as a result of the suffragette movement. Women and men who supported uh, this idea uh, demonstrated, they called on the government to change the law, and eventually the U.S. government did change the law so that women can vote. Women like, Henry, uh, um, like uh, Hillary Clinton can run for public office, and uh, we think that makes for a, stronger, uh, for a stronger country. To sort of go back to where I started with regard to the definition of civil society, uh, the term civil society is sort of a new idea. It's a new term, but it's, uh, it's not really a US term and it's not really a Western um, idea. Uh, we can't really say that we invented it. Really, it is the norm in uh, human history. And Secretary Clinton actually calls it prehistory because it's the most basic way we as humans organize ourselves. We get together with a group that is kind of like-minded and is interested in the same idea. I mean, I'm imagining a group of cavemen who uh, needed to go out and hunt for food. They couldn't do it alone because the animals were so much bigger, so they kind of got together and organized and, and made that happen. And you know, in a much more in, in, a, in a different way on different topics, that's what we're doing now, and that's what civil society is all about: people working together to achieve their aims. And this is true, you know, whether it's Armenia, whether it's the United States, whether it's um, some other country. In the 19th century, for example, Armenians dreamed of again having their own state. And they wrote about it, and they spoke about it, they organized, they banded together to, in associations and parties, and opened schools to pass on Armenia's language, literature, history, and culture before they finally had the opportunity to establish the first republic. And for centuries before that, Armenia's oldest civil society institution, 
the Armenian Apostolic Church anchored a nation that was often dominated by foreign powers. The Soviet model, government control of all aspects of life on behalf of a single ruling party, was actually, I think, not the norm over the centuries of Armenia's uh, history. And now Ar Armenia has the opportunity to build a stable, resilient, and just democracy with power balanced between those inside and outside the government. Although traditional media remains important, it no longer, no longer can governments prevent the spread of ideas they don't like merely by denying them space in mass media. News is no longer a one-way stream in which those with power determine what information will be shared and what ideas the people will be trusted with. Governments that try to ration information and stifle criticism only erode their own legitimacy and undermine their ability to reform economies, to fight corruption, to attract investment, create jobs, hold free elections, and manage their relations with their neighbors. Now, you know, I think we can all uh, understand that nobody likes being criticized. And I can share with you that as the US ambassador, uh, I don't like to be criticized either. But I know from my own experience that uh, whatever I do, whether I'm in Armenia or whether I'm in the US or in some other country, I'm going to be criticized. And maybe you all will criticize me after this speech as well. But you know, that's OK because that's what it comes with the turf. It's important to debate ideas and have an honest discussion about what we about what we think because our ideas become better. They become stronger if they have been challenged and we, you know, refine them and make them um, make them better. And as uh, President Sarkisian said uh, not so very long ago, in Armenia, the way forward is to create a well-developed democracy, a more active political dialogue, and persistent adaptation of European standards into all areas of our political, social, and economic lives. So clearly, the solution is not to restrict freedom of speech or access to ideas, or to restrict the right of citizens to assemble in support of those ideas, but rather to take those ideas, even the criticism of, of our seriously, and debate them in public on their merits. The more information citizens have, the better decisions they make, the better our, our government becomes. In political discourse around the world, People tend to polarize, they exaggerate criticisms, and they paint their opponents as not only wrong, but as corrupt, as unpatriotic. But honest political discourse starts with the presumption that all of us, even those we most disagree with, are driven by a genuine love of our country. The ideas we hear may be right or they may be wrong, but only the people of Armenia, through unfettered debate and through free and fair elections, are qualified to make that judgment. And I, I, I commend to you uh, the saying of a very great American writer who some of you may, may know, uh, Mark Twain. He said, patriotism, patriotism is supporting your country all of the time and your government when it deserves it. During the past two and a half years, I've traveled all over Armenia, and the young people I've met are patriotic, creative, entrepreneurial. They dream of a prosperous future in Armenia. And I ask you, what happens to that dream? What happens to the young if their entrepreneurial dreams are crushed by unfair competition against politically connected businesses? Or if expressing controversial ideas puts them and their families at risk of retribution? What happens if individuals can't organize and lobby their government, or if the elections to choose their leaders don't appear to be free and fair? What happens if they are unable to hear and share a variety of opinions in the media? Empowering civil society not only holds the key to Armenia's democracy and prosperity, it's vital for the nation's security. And what better time to begin that empowerment than right now? 
the well-developed democracy and more active political dialogue that President Sarkisian called for will require deep and difficult changes, and it will require all elements of society working together on this, government, NGOs, business. It will require reforms to Armenia's laws and institutions and political culture to expand liberty, freedom, and also responsibility. It will require applying international best practices to the regulation and protection of NGOs, encouraging philanthropy and volunteer labor, and allowing NGOs to earn appropriate kinds of income in support of their missions and their ability to engage and partner with the government. It will require applying laws consistently to ever, everyone, from the rich and the powerful to the poor and the unknown and ensuring that peaceful, lawful assemblies will not be harassed or broken up. It will require rules on media that harness the unbelievable technological advances of our age to broaden rather than to narrow the range of ideas and voices available to all of us in the public and that shield media against political pressure from any side so that, again, different ideas and opinions receive fair access to the airwaves. It will require that criminals who assault journalists are caught and are punished. And it will require that the government, Armenian Public Television, the Central Election Commission, the police, and all political parties assure that future elections meet not only international standards, but also the expectations and demands of all of you, of the Armenian people. But there are also responsibilities and burdens that come with the freedom to disagree, with the freedom to criticize. Part of what we call the social compact at the heart of any civil society is the obligation to do more than just sit back and complain. If we are going to exercise our right to criticize, then we also have an obligation to our country, to our families, and our children to get into the game, to be part of the solution, to partner with the government, and to create a better future. If NGOs, opposition political parties, and independent media have the right to criticize, and they must have that right, they also have the obligation to search for solutions in good faith with the government, just as government must open its decision-making processes and encourage public debate. And we see examples here in Armenia when civil society and government have challenged and debated each other constructively, and legislation and policy are coming out better as a result. And I'll give you a couple of examples, and maybe you all have others. This past May, Parliamentary hearings sought input from NGOs and the public on draft NGO law amendments. The recommendations and proposals of NGOs led to a number of revisions and improvements to the draft. And we expect that Armenia will, in the end, have a better NGO law as a result of that dialogue. Another example, as some of you may know, there's currently a pretty lively debate regarding proposed hotel and parking taxes. A debate that draws in professional associations, members of parliament, local governments, tourism agencies, hotels, and small and medium enterprises. Tourism businesses fear additional tax burdens that would make Armenian tourism less competitive because their prices would go up. But local governments welcome those increased taxes uh, because it would bring additional revenue that they could invest to improve community well-being and to enhance the tourism opportunity. So clearly both sides have a legitimate point of view. What's the right answer? And the only way to get to uh, the I'm not sure there is one single right answer, but the best answer for Armenia at this time is to actively debate that, uh, that issue to figure out what all the pros and cons are and then work to um, put the solution in the law. And this discussion has allowed the National Assembly to see all sides of the issue in order to make the bill as fair to all as possible. Civil society bears another duty, namely keeping its own house in order. Corruption, favoritism, transparency, accountability, democratic governance. These issues
issues don't just challenge governments. They challenge all of us. Civil society has every right to demand the highest standards of government bodies and officials. But to speak with credibility, civil society must model the integrity it wishes to see in the state and has to be open to criticism itself. All of us are now more and more active participants in the sharing and evolution of ideas. And the challenge of modern politics is to compete in a marketplace of ideas for Armenia's future. Because if you're not willing to act, if you're not willing to compete, I can assure you there are others out there that are. And you know, the question is, do you want to leave Armenia's future to others, or do you want to be active in that dialogue, active in that debate, and help to create the future? You know where I think you should be on this. I hope that all of you use all of the tools at your disposal, new and old, from the smartphone to the community bulletin board. We've heard a lot about the, all the new technologies, you know, Twitter and YouTube and, and Facebook and everything else. And I think that's all critical, but I think they're only tools. What really matters is what you guys think and do. And these are tools uh, for you to affect uh, your ideas. You can use those tools to participate, to debate ideas, to share your thoughts, opinions, and needs, to engage in civil society, and partner with government, honestly and in good faith. You cannot live, none of us can live, in the kind of country that we want if you don't act. Your actions can be simple, such as organizing your neighbors to clean up the local park so the kids have a clean place to play, a clean green place to play or uh, cleaning up the stairwell in your apartment building. Or they can be a lot more complicated, complex, profound, such as advocating for a more progressive media law. The way you get involved is really up to you. But both actions, I would argue, create a better Armenia and are important for that reason. This is one of the best universities in the country. I think at least one person here would say it's the best university in the country. And you will be Armenia's leaders. You hold the future in your hands. So I want to close with the words of President Obama in his address to the students at Cairo University in June 2009. I want to particularly say this to young people of every faith in every country. You, more than anyone, have the ability to reimagine the world, to remake this world. All of us share this world for but a brief moment in time. The question is whether we spend that time focused on what pushes us apart, or whether we commit ourselves to an effort, a sustained effort, to find common ground, to focus on the future we seek for our children and to respect the dignity of all human beings. So with those words of President Obama, I leave you uh, with that thought. And um, I really encourage all of your questions. I'm interested in hearing what you're thinking about, uh, what you're curious about, and how you see Armenia's future and the role of uh, civil society in it. Thank you.